Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're from. My name is Jay Lee from KAIST. I'm pleased to introduce the third plenary speaker of this conference, Dr. Kai Sundmacher from Max Planck Institute for Dynamics of Complex Technical Systems, Magdeburg, Germany. Professor Kai Sundmacher got his diploma studies in chemical and process engineering at the Klossal University of Technology in 1990, and his doctoral degree of engineering from the same university in 1995. And from 1995 to 1998, he was working as a research leader. 97, 98, he was a research fellow at the University of Newcastle in the UK, and he was awarded, okay, let me pronounce this right, <laughs> habilitation and venia legendi in the subjects of chemical and separation engineering. And Dr. Sundmacher won numerous awards, including Carl Zerbe Award by German Scientific Society of Petrochemistry in 1998, Arnold Oiken Award by German Society of Chemical Engineers in 1999, and Maya Stuckmann Award by Corpus University of Technology in 2008. And he has been a professor for process systems engineering at the Otto von Guerke University Magdeburg since 1999, and the director of the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics of Complex Te Technical Systems Magdeburg since 2001. He's also the executive editor of Chemical Engineering Science at Elsevier and has an Einstein prof professorship at the Chinese Academy of Sciences and since 2010, he has been a guest professor at East China University of Science and Technology in Shanghai, China. Now today, uh, his presentation is entitled Multiscale Design of Process Systems for Efficient Chemicals Production and Energy Conversion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sunmacher. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for your very kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to my lecture dedicated to the model level design of process systems for chemicals production and energy conversion. I would like to thank the organizer, in particular Professor Ghani, for his very kind invitation to come here and for an excellent organization of a fantastic conference here in Copenhagen. Um, I think we all agree that chemical engineering and PSE as part of chemical engineering has to serve the needs of society and we see really big challenges in the near future in terms of productivity, for example, where we have to supply water, food, fuels, healthcare products for 10 billion people in the middle of the century on this planet. And we, are, we also agree, I guess, that we have to create sustainable processes. Sustainability is also a big issue on this uh, conference. We see it in many contributions these days, that we have to rely on solar, wind, on energy and biomass primarily. And at the same time, the expectation is that the functionality of products like batteries, colors, etc., should be improve even further and new functionalities have to be implemented into the products. Products, uh, we will also see a diversification of products, much larger variety when it comes, for example, to personalized medicine, APIs, it's clear that we have to generate many compounds, very specific uh, molecules, uh, tailor-made molecules, so to say, that is another challenge. Furthermore, on-demand production and flexible factories, also factories which uh, can cope with fluctuating energies is another big challenge for process systems engineering. And at the end of the day, of course, the expectation of the society is that we can all do this and derive technologies to uh, allow them to live at a high standard of living cost, uh, living at low costs and lowest environmental impact. That is the expectation, and it's clear that uh, we can meet these expectations only 
if we are able to derive a next generation of chemical and energy processes, I would call them green processes because some of them have, uh, should have features which we do not see in today's uh, technologies and uh, process, uh, processes in, in industry. So highly productive, selective, based on renewable feedstocks and energies, of course. We have to close the global cycles, in particular the carbon cycle, and also other cycles like the phosphorus cycle, also phosphor. We are running out of phosphor, as you may know, in 70 years. We have another problem with uh, other resources. And, uh, of course, the processes at the same time have to be inherently uh, safe and cheap. Now, when in the past we have relied very, very much, and this is still um, true for many industrial companies, on classical design of flow sheets for chemical processes. We have raw materials which are pre-processed. They run into a reactor or reactor system, whatever. Um, then it comes to the separation system. Uh, and at the end of the day, we need some recycles and we isolate products and separate them from side products. And uh, we have relied very much, uh, conceptually speaking, on the unit operations concept. The unit operations concept is now 100 years old. Maybe you know that in 1915, uh, in this uh, Arthur de Little report, the pro, uh, unit operations concept was uh, mentioned for the first time. So the question is, should we have a big party on 100 years unit operations? Well, it was very influential. It was a very influential concept and it's still a very important basis when it comes to also optimization of processes because we have ready unit operations, we have models for them, we can play with that and uh, try to make superstructures based on those unit operations and try to squeeze out the best uh, configuration. In many cases, uh, people rely on established devices. So we have, so to say, libraries uh, with uh, ready technologies and we can put that together and uh, then we have a whole plant or so. That is nice. On the other hand, we have seen during the last uh, 20, 30 years, process intensification actions. Uh, here I have a very popular example for you with the Eastman Kodak process for methyl acetate production. And I think it's still a kind of killer application of process intensification actions because as we see here, we have, oh sorry, uh, we have here uh, instead of a network of one reactor followed by 10 separation devices, primarily distillation, extraction, and uh, decantation, we uh, have only one single column inside which the reaction is performed simultaneously with the distillative separation. And due to the special uh, features of that particular reaction system, the uh, esterification reaction, it was possible to extract mesa acetate and water, so the products of the re of this reaction as uh, pure products uh, from that uh, single column. That is, of course, very, very good example how we can replace a network of unit operations by one highly integrated process. On the other hand, we also have seen many innovations based on chemical tricks. Huh? Playing with the molecules is another uh, important field where we can search for process intensification options. Here I have one example for you, the Basile process biphasic acid scavenging utilizing ionic liquids. It is a synthesis of an alkoxyphenyl phosphine where you normally use a tertiary amine as an acid scavenger and then you run into a solid liquid uh, slurry at the end of the day because your products uh, are partly in the solid phase. And that is of course uh, uh, not so beneficial for process operation. Instead, if you use uh, this ionic liquid as the essence scavenger, then you generate a product uh, mixture which is purely in the liquid-liquid phase and uh, much easier to process. And in addition, this is a side effect, this is side product um, autocatalytically activates the reaction itself. And due to this phase changing, uh, changes of the uh, phases, we can, uh, or the, the BISF at that time was able to move that process from a batch reactor to a very smart jet type continuous reactor with a space time yield increase by a factor of eight times 10 to the power of four, which is a very impressive example, how chemistry and changing the molecules can have a big impact on uh, the uh, process operation. 
And there are many more, as we all know, process intensification options in our toolbox of today. This is from this millennium uh, issue of CEP, the famous paper of Sankiewicz and Moulin, where they have uh, listed up all the equipment and methods available at that time in process intensification. Since that, we have now found more possibilities also to systematically screen that. And uh, many of us are working on process intensification and also on this conference we see many nice examples how we can revolutionize partly our processes by using some of these tools in the box. So in other words, um, we are still moving from the unit operation concept and I would call this a paradigm shift actually in chemical engineering, also in process systems engineering. Uh, unit operation concept was very influential. It is based on existing devices, ready solutions, but it often imposes constraints uh, for breakthroughs in productivity, selectivity, and flexibility, etc. It narrows, so to say, the solution space for process design and optimization. And that was the motivation in my group some years ago to start uh, the development of a new concept, which we call elementary process function concept, which is uh, thinking in terms of elementary functions to be fulfilled on the different scales of the process system and uh, to design an optimal process route in an abstract way from educt to product and thereby consider the whole spectrum of possibilities in terms of mechanisms for mass transfer, heat transfer, or so forth, which are provided by physics, chemistry, and also by biology, maybe in the future, we may use some of the synthetic biology approaches also to improve our biotechnology processes in particular. So this uh, paradigmatic shift uh, and our developments uh, led us uh, to uh, thinking in terms of this uh, pyramid or this hierarchy. Our process hierarchy is structured in uh, four levels. Uh, when you decompose, so you analyze your process, you normally you have an existing plant. This is the top level, the plant level, and you analyze that means you decompose that into still process units, which are available there. And in the units, phases are interacting. So uh, in our philosophy, um, different phases um, form uh, situations uh, for process uh, on the process unit level. So the, the mass transfer, the heat transfer between these uh, phases it has to be considered on that red level. And underneath there is a molecular level, uh, which is uh, uh, very important for the phase level because as we all know, the phases are ensembles of uh, molecules. And so we have also to consider this molecular level because that offers some uh, very interesting options for new decision variables, so to say. And these days we have seen in the molecular systems engineering sessions how uh, that can have a big impact on the overall performance of a chemical production process, for example. So uh, after point one, beyond unit operations, I now come to uh, the second point uh, in my uh, lecture here, the multi-level design approach. And I would like to illustrate that along an example which we have considered uh, in the last few years, namely the synthesis of linear aldehydes from uh, uh, longer chain uh, alkenes, or olefins, which can be uh, obtained or harvested from uh, renewable resources. And I would actually run through these different levels, starting with the molecular level, because in designing the system, we should start with the molecules first and then move on to the phase level, process unit level, and the plant level. This is uh, our philosophy. And after this example, I would like to show you also how we can transfer the same way of thinking to energy processes with two examples for you with the power to gas uh, technology and a fuel cell vehicle technology. And finally, I will conclude the talk with some final remarks. So let's start with the molecular level. On the molecular level, we have a number of main decisions to make. Normally, your target product is, of course, fixed, the green one. Um, Question is, how can we make this target product out of certain molecules? And the stoichiometry says that certain combinations of A and B will make this uh, product C. So this is just the stoichiometry of the main reaction, which is the main platform for your process design. And of course, the question is always, do we have coupled products or side products? So what kind of byproducts do we have? And um, 
uh, in order, so once we have fixed A and B, the other question is, do we have really catalysts in order to enable these reactions to really proceed, to really happen? And do we need solvents of all the catalysts or any of these uh, uh, products in order to stay in certain phases? And once the molecules are fixed, once the main mass fluxes are uh, uh, determined, then of course we can also determine uh, the heat which has to be supplied or removed from the process and the power. The main decision criteria here should be atomic efficiency. So the number of excess atoms should be as low as possible. And uh, you can see many examples in existing technologies which violate, so to say, the atomic efficiency criterion. Um, uh, when you check that, you see that there's much space still for optimization also of traditional chemical processes because many of them have too many, so to say, excess atoms in their uh, reactants. Transformation efficiency uh, uh, is uh, with regard to the number of intermediate steps. So how many steps do we have really to, uh, to go through in order to make our target product? The feedstocks for A and B, okay, they should be available, of course. Uh, the price is an issue, the storage is an issue, maybe also the safety. Sustainability, the CO2 footprint can be also directly derived from a very simple flow scheme on this molecular level. And um, we can also uh, discuss uh, catalysts here. Are there catalysts available? Normally, this is not something which process engineers are developing. They have to interact with uh, industrial chemists, technical chemistry, in order to find really an, a catalyst with an acceptable price, activity, selectivity, longevity, and separability. Also, separability is an issue which I will touch in the remainder of my talk in a few slides. And last but not least, uh, another uh, class of auxiliary uh, players, so to say, in, in, on this level are solvents. Also, they have to be considered in terms of price, hazardousness, availability. So if we apply this now to uh, the example which I have promised to you, the uh, 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 formation of a long chain uh, aldehyde, namely three decanars with a C13 uh, linear uh, aldehyde, uh, which is depicted over here. It's a biodegradable compound, by the way. It can be used as a flavor, plasticizer, and as a surfactant. And uh, you can easily derive that this molecular structure, of course, is very close to 1-dudecene, which is a corresponding C12 um, uh, alkene. And by addition of uh, hydrogen and CO, this is just an addition reaction without any coupled uh, byproduct, which is uh, very good in terms of uh, at, um, at atomic efficiency, you can directly make this uh, three decanal. Um, but uh, when you uh, perform this reaction, it's also automatically clear that um, the uh, functionalization of this uh, double bond sitting here is, uh, can be never done such that you harvest 100% of your desired uh, target product. Instead, you have also other um, aldehydes, uh, primarily the branched aldehydes like this one here, the 2 methyl 2 decanal, which is a non biodegradable compound. You still can sell it at the market, but at a considerably lower price, but it is not, uh, not uh, biodegradable and, so to say, not uh, green at this point. The other point is that once you have fixed now this molecule, is nice, but you have to go... Um, um, to uh, uh, other molecules in order to, to ask yourself, so what is really the supply chain in order to make this molecule? Well, one dodecene uh, can be made uh, from a one dodecane, which comes from, can be isolated from crude oil. And via thermocatalytic dehydrogenation, you can make this molecule very easily. The uh, Avonic company uh, recently uh, launched a pro uh, uh, project, uh, Valeri, or it's, it's more or less finished now, but there they have investigated the photocatalytic dehydrogenation, um, having in mind that uh, maybe some renewable energy can be used for functionalization of this uh, one dodecane. But still, the one dodecane comes from crude oil. A more attractive route, which is a more green one, and a bio route, I would say, is route two, where we might take ethanol from biomass, um, so bioethanol, 
And via dehydration, you can get uh, bioethylene. And uh, this bioethylene is now very popular, for example, in Brazil. And via the, the shop, the shell higher olefin process, uh, via addition some hydrogen, you can, uh, so to say, uh, oligomerize uh, the ethylene and make longer chain um, uh, alkenes like a 1 dodi scene. So there are now interesting routes, and I would say there's an option to make really this molecule, the biodegradable molecule, also from bioresources. So the, from that perspective, this uh, route is good. So in the main remainder of my talk, I now focus on the hydroformylation part of this process, and we should ask ourselves how can we make uh, the best hydroformylation process of that process chain. First, you have to isolate, of course, or find, identify a catalyst. There are quite a few catalysts, namely transition metal uh, compounds. Rhodium is the most um, active uh, transition metal uh, in this uh, series. It's uh, 1,000 times uh, more active than cobalt, for example, and many processes are still running on cobalt in hydroformylation industries. Uh, the other ones uh, are not uh, really relevant. But also the price is more than 10 uh, 1,000 times higher than for cobalt. And so if we use this catalyst and rely on the high activity, activity of rhodium as a central atom of our uh, catalyst, then it's absolutely clear now that quantitative catalyst recycling is necessary for economic uh, process uh, operation. Um, activity is one part of this, uh, of this molecular catalyst. The other part is a chelating uh, ligand. And uh, here is just a cartoon of many ligands, and I could have you shown even more ones from chemistry books and uh, uh, homogeneous uh, cat uh, catalysis. This is uh, taken from the book of my colleague, Professor Beer from Dortmund University, and he has here investigated uh, during his whole, whole business life many uh, homogeneous catalysts, in particular hydroformylation, and the recommendation was from batch screening experiments that this PFAFOS catalyst is pretty expensive. It has nearly the same price uh, per mole as uh, rhodium has, um, but it, is, it, it provides a high chemo and stereo selectivity with uh, regard to the formation of the, this desired tetracanal molecule. So in the remainder, we are talking about the PFAFOS catalyst in combination with rhodium. Now this, as I said, this catalyst is now very expensive, so we have to keep it in the process. It's a homogeneous catalyst, it's nice, you can design it, unlike heterogeneous catalysts where you have a support and you never really understand the interaction between the active compounds and, this, and, and the support. Here you have really catalysts which are designable. When I saw this first as an engineer, I was really fascinated to see that here are opportunities future opportunities in particular because the models are not so safe so far for uh, PSE approaches. So really molecular systems engineering of these molecular catalysts. Uh, theoreticians in chemistry have already succeeded a bit to make some predictions on how these catalysts are working, but this is still very un, uh, yeah, uncertain, so to say, and uh, many questions are open, but in particular, I would like to to, uh, to emphasize here that this is really a catalyst which can be designed. And now we can also integrate another separation function to separate this catalyst or catalyst function to m enable this catalyst to be separated from the product mixture. Uh, okay, the ligand has to interact with a reactant and uh, this catalyst has to stay in this phase, of course. But how can we separate it? One option is to create a bond, a uh, covalent bond uh, from this ligand to a solid, su solid support. But very often you change then your activity and selectivity. This is not uh, normally not the way to go. Another option is to keep it as a homogeneous catalyst but, and to bind uh, to this ligand a polymer chain where you can now uh, design the length of this polymer chain. And if you make this very long under certain conditions and uh, cool, uh, lower temperatures, you form a solid phase and you can precipitate your catalyst and filter it out of the process after the reaction, which is one option. Uh, filtration is also, and, and dissolution again of the solid catalyst is not so nice. Another possibility is to keep it in the liquid phase and to keep this uh, polymer chain 
so long that it is uh, the catalyst as such, the whole uh, configuration is always in the liquid phase, but can be kept back by uh, membranes like organophilic nanofiltration membranes, or if it is even larger, this molecule by ultrafiltration membranes. This is another possibility. Of course, uh, uh, the reactants, they have to be separated from this. And in other words, we need in organophilic nanofiltration, in our case, the aldehydes uh, being formed have to be separated via this membrane and only the catalyst should be kept back. Recent investigations also in Dortmund uh, in the group of Professor Gorak have shown that this is a nice technology. And also in other groups, Cole Hamilton, for example, in the UK, they have investigated that for a long time, the ultrafiltration and nanofiltration membranes. But there are still many problems, poor blocking, etc., limited selectivity, and so forth. Uh, another option, which is much simpler, I would say, than the design of a membrane, is uh, to offer, so to say, a second phase into which only the reactants are jumping because they have a much higher affinity to this phase than the ligand, which uh, st uh, would like to stay in, in phase one. So that brings us to the concept of uh, solvents uh, in order to separate uh, this catalyst. So how can we design a solvent uh, in order to run into a biphasic regime after the reaction? And that is shown over here. We have here uh, shown uh, the uh, uh, a strategy for catalyst uh, separation. You see here uh, a triangle of uh, two uh, sol uh, solvent compounds, namely a polar one and a non-polar one. And so the react reactant, so our olefin, ha should have an intermediate polarity between these two extremes. And during the reaction, we would like to stay here, somewhere here, where here is a binodal curve, so here is phase splitting, but the operating point is selected such that during the reaction we have a homogeneous liquid phase. Now by phase of a temperature change, maybe by cooling down, we can, um, with a clever selection of these uh, compounds and the right po polarity sequence, so to say, we can generate conditions such that under separation conditions, so after the reaction at lower temperature, with the uh, binodal curve is here, and now our post-reaction mixture is sitting here, and now we are discussing this triangle with the product, so with the tree diagonal. We would like now to separate this, and according to this tie line, we have two different product phases, namely the phase where our target product is inside, and the other phase, which should be here, the more polar one, where the catalyst would be sitting in case that we have a ligand, like b -fephos, which also has a high polarity, so it likes to stay in that phase. So that is the, uh, the idea, and we, uh, the people in Dortmund, Professor Beer, they, they call it thermomorphic multi-component solvents. So instead of designing with CAMD methods or so a particular new solvent molecule, the philosophy is here to make use of existing solvent molecules and try to find conditions and mixtures under which this TMS behavior um, happens and such that we can easily use the temperature and easily accessible process variable in order to separate the catalyst after the reaction. The state of the art in selecting those uh, solvent compounds is uh, they, they do it based on experiments, LLE experiments and Hansen parameters as uh, descriptors, so to say. The challenge is from our point of view now to incorporate also the molecular catalyst structure because so far when selecting these solvents, people, the chemists, do not normally look at the catalyst. They just look at the product and how the product can be harvested from the mixture. But due to the very high impact of catalyst loss on the overall process performance with regard to the uh, uh, catalyst cost by catalyst leaching, we have really to incorporate here the molecular structure in selecting uh, when, when selecting uh, the solvents for this TMS system. And the way how we did it was <clears throat> we were making use of the COSMO model, so the conductor-like screening model, which is a quantum chemical approach and uh, is uh, depicted here in, a, um, I must admit, a very busy slide, but uh, we'll try to guide you quickly through. So we start with um, defining this catalyst Lingen structure and we perform uh, via Tobomol a DFT calculation in order to find a stable configuration, the most stable configuration of that molecule. 
And uh, via Cosmo, you, you can then calculate the uh, uh, screening uh, charge density surface. And that is then the input information which you can directly use uh, based on uh, statistical thermodynamics to make predictions, for example, on chemical potentials and also to make predictions then based on that on the relative solubilities of um, uh, or solubility of this um, uh, catalyst uh, ligand in different solvents. We did the same also for the uh, product molecule, the g decanal in order to find out what are the best solvents for the catalyst and for the g decanal We had a number out of, out of a database which is uh, provided by uh, Cosmologics and their uh, Cosmo RS uh, software. Um, we had directly access to nearly 8,000 uh, solvent species, out of which we selected about 400 uh, uh, product solvents and 100 catalyst solvents, which have a high or low solubilities for the respective uh, molecules. That leads uh, us uh, to, uh, uh, in this uh, binary pair of the two solvents, to 40,000 options uh, to make a, a TMS uh, system. But only a few of them uh, really show this TMS behavior in a reasonable temperature window. So we can make predictions now in which temperature window um, those solvents uh, show the uh, requested behavior that uh, they are monophasic under reaction conditions and biphasic under separation conditions, so room temperature or even lower. And uh, out of these many combinations we, uh, which led to TMS behavior, we could also take out uh, quite a few uh, which were not environmentally friendly or uh, due to their hazardousness, are uh, not, uh, of course, uh, uh, solvents which we should really take. In the next step, then, we uh, teamed up with uh, Professor Gersgrub in Dortmund in order to also make uh, experiments in order to check uh, whether the predictions based on uh, this uh, Cosmo model are correct or which of the, uh, which of the candidates which we have uh, squeezed out uh, can do a good job for this uh, process. And here are the results. I've shown you here a number of, um, of uh, binary pairs, TMS systems, for practical reasons and because uh, Professor Beer has a lot of, had, had done a lot of experiments already with n decane. One of these solvents was fixed, by the other, other one, the polar one, was varied. And what we see here is in uh, blue uh, the uh, catalyst distribution coefficient, which, which in this plot should be as high as possible. And uh, the uh, distribution coefficient or partition coefficient uh, for tree decanal, which should be at lowest possible. And we check that in experiments. So we did some LLEs and uh, measurements and also some reaction engineer measurements because we have to make sure that these uh, uh, um, solvents not only uh, are the right solvents in order to make the separation, but uh, also solvents which allow uh, the catalyst really to do the job. And here are the experimental results. So based on this pre-selection, um, let's focus here on this uh, partition coefficients of the ligand, so the phosphine ligand, and the rhodium itself, the so central atom, so to say. What we see is that three uh, remaining candidates are here, dimethyl formamide with N-decane, NND meth methyl acid acetamide, and the uh, NMP. So they are, have nearly the same uh, performance in terms of the separation of this uh, catalyst. But with regard to the selectivity of this catalyst in the reaction, dimethyl formamide, formamide, sorry, DMF, combined with n decane seems to be the best option. And uh, so that prediction was made. Um, fortunately, I would say, uh, we found out that um, this uh, system was also the system uh, which was used over many years by Professor Beer. So, uh, and he has developed this over the years based on his know-how as a chemist and uh, empirical uh, data uh, harvesting, so to say. But here, the system is confirmed to be, out of a large set of potential candidates, really the best uh, option for uh, this particular task. So once you have now uh, isolated the catalyst or identified the catalyst and a suitable separation technology, so to say, system, the next step is now to really understand the catalytic reaction cycle and other byproducts because we all know 
that it is not uh, possible to design really an industrial process only based on the reactance of the main stoichiometric reaction or one side reaction. We have to really we have to understand uh, the reaction and the catalytic cycles, and you see that this is really complex. And my colleague Andreas Reiter Morgenstern in Magdeburg with his reaction engineering group have worked out this uh, catalytic cycle. They have found out that there's a catalytic activation step. Then we have a, in blue hydroformulation cycle. And in um, acid reactions, we see hydrogenation steps and isomerization steps. That was all squeezed out with enormous efforts using analytical tools or advanced analytical tools like Raman, ER, and IR, and so forth. And at the end of the day, it was, we were, they were possible uh, together with the uh, Watson Group in Berlin to reduce that network uh, and uh, to uh, boil it down to five main reactions and seven main species. And what we see here is that there is an isomerization reaction of this uh, internal, of this uh, one alkene. This is a desired reaction R1, the desired product. But uh, uh, as a matter of fact, all the time we lose some alkene due to the hydrogenation and we form alkanes. We have uh, an I a reversible isomerization due to the uh, moving of the double bond along this molecule. And as a consequence of the same, we also form some isoaldehydes, uh, so the branched aldehydes which we do not want. So the, the, the challenge is now later on on the phase level to influence the system such that uh, we are only running into this N uh, aldehyde and we block, so to say, the other reactions. So as these are now the molecular levels, the molecular players, which we have here uh, collected, so to say. And with that, we are now running onto the phase level. On the phase level, we are taking an abstract view, namely, instead of looking at a reactor, a specific reactor, a specific device, we consider a meta element, um, generalized meta element, uh, here characterized by a state vector x of T, temperature, pressure, velocity, chemical composition. And that is manipulated at states by fluxes, internal and external fluxes, namely mass fluxes, the reactions inside, stress. So if it, when it comes to forces and we move it through the process, also where the mechanical forces have to be considered as in this generalized flux, flux vector, the heat flux and also the work. And then we can track this meta element along a route in the state space. And the task is now to uh, steer this uh, meta element from a starting point to a final point and to find something like an ideal process route just based on the reaction kinetics first. So we consider only this meta element. This is not linked directly to any device, to any particular process unit. We try to find, so to say, the ideal travel route of this Lagrangian uh, uh, observer, if you want. Um, the travel route uh, direction can be derived easily from the balance equations of the meta element. They're here it is given and it's depicted again here. Namely, uh, at any point uh, along this process route, you can span a vector uh, diagram, which um, indicates uh, elementary uh, route directions, as we call them. They can be identified as the column vectors of a matrix, which consists of the capacity matrix inverse multiplied by a flux, flux coupling matrix where our stoichiometry and uh, other, other factors are sitting. And the main point is now that the length of these vectors, so the intensity of the fluxes, mass and heat fluxes, decides about the, the root direction x dot. The uh, attainable region can be here also depicted at any actual point from here. And of course, you have also some uh, boundaries here of this, uh, the dashed lines due to equilibrium conditions where the fluxes are vanishing due to uh, thermodynamic equilibria. So this con concept was a basis to uh, set up a dynamic optimization problem, which is uh, written down here in a standard way, but in the variables which I have just introduced, we have a cost functional, we have the balance equations, in the form of ODEs, and we have also some algebraic equations, namely thermodynamic state equations and the reaction kinetics, and maybe some, some uh, inequality constraints due to bounds of temperature, pressure, conversion, if you want. The main point is now that we touch directly 
uh, the external fluxes as control variables. So we use them and we use them as uh, unconstrained uh, control variables in our dynamic optimization problem in the very first step. But this only can be solved then at the end of the day if we have really information about the reaction kinetics, about the uh, reaction rate expressions. So uh, together with the Seidel Morgenstern group in uh, Magdeburg, we did a number of iterations in order to identify the reaction kinetics for that particular system. And the best way uh, we found for this uh, system was to do perturbation experiments in a semi-batch reactor in order to parameterize uh, this reduced reaction uh, network. The perturbation was done by actions on alkene input and uh, syngas composition and amount. And we were also able to change uh, the temperature via the heat flux. And by doing this and by application of a standard uh, optimal experimental design techniques, here the D-optimality criterion was chosen, we were able to parameterize the reaction rate expressions. And you see that we have nonlinear uh, equations, of course, as function of temperature and the concentration measures in that uh, system. And based on this information, we were then able to solve this dynamic optimization problem uh, for um, a given or fixed conversion of the one alkene. So for any specific conversion, we get here now one optimal control action along this process route, which gives you the best selectivity. So this is the best selectivity line for any conversion you, d you decide uh, to, to have for this one alkene. And it's, uh, it contradicts the textbooks. Uh, for simple reactions, normally what we get is a decreasing line of the selectivity over conversion. But the surprise here was to see, due to this uh, uh, highly nonlinear reaction uh, network, that we have also obviously a branch at very high conversion where we can achieve high selectivity and high conversion at the same time. And that was also confirmed experimentally in the semi-batch reactor experiments, by the way. And here we, you see the fluxes which belong to this point. Uh, we have to dose hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And the optimizer says uh, that uh, no dosing of alkene is necessary. Only the syngas compounds have to be dosed in a stoichiometric, uh, stoichiometric uh, ratio. So that was the prediction. And if you want to understand, we, of course, we yeah, try to get an insight. Why is it so? And uh, the surprising effect here was, or the, it was not surprising because we had understood this reaction network, or if you have this reaction network really clarified, then you can see that what happens is that in the first phase of this uh, batch reactor or semi-batch reactor, you have uh, primarily the hydroformylation reaction to the desired product, but unfortunately also some loss due to the isomerization reaction. But... Um, then after some time, when uh, a certain level of these internal alkenes have been formed, you can reverse this reaction. And by a backward isomerization, you can form even more an aldehyde. So uh, this trick um, requires relatively long uh, resonance time in the reactor. Nevertheless, by, by doing so, you can achieve um, an increase again of the selectivity at relatively high conversion. And that was not so intu intu uh, intuitive. It was not predicted uh, by the chemical partners in our research network at uh, that time. Okay, but now the problem is, okay, how can we really implement this ideal solution on, uh, on the uh, reactor level? So for that purpose, we have developed uh, uh, here my former PhD student, Andrea Special. Uh, he has developed in his PhD uh, dissertation a very nice strategy, namely by uh, moving through a three-level design procedure, we can uh, first uh, determine the optimal route, as I've just showed to you, with unlimited fluxes. Then we can limit the fluxes by really writing down the kinetics for mass and heat transfer. And then we have additional constraints due to limited uh, kinetic coefficients and also limited environmental levels. For example, the cooling temperature or the heating temperature, of course, has certain bounds. And that leads to limited fluxes, and le that leads to uh, another uh, type of uh, control uh, 
uh, uh, control actions. And then the third step is how we can tactically approximate uh, the decisions being made on level two. And uh, uh, for that purpose, we have now two options. Either we can um, implement uh, the uh, solution which we have obtained on level two in a semi-batch reactor, an optimally operated semi-batch reactor, of course. But the other option is, of course, to do this in a continuous way by discrete dosing. Uh, and here we translate, so to say, the time coordinate into a residence time coordinate in space of a continuous reactor, for example, of such a segmented flow reactor with reactant dosing. Of course, you will have some loss of optimality simply due to the fact that you have only a limited number of discrete dosing points, for example. And in addition to that, you might have uh, additional limitations due to mass transfer and so forth. You might also select another reactor rather than that, a bubble column or so, by in investigation of uh, the uh, optimal solutions under variation of the transport coefficients, you can mimic different uh, regimes in different apparatuses and thereby then at the end of the day select the best solution for your system. But even then, you cannot be sure that in a continuous reactor, this uh, solution really uh, leads to the optimum in, uh, real, in, in real world, uh, under real world conditions. And, uh, you have uh, to consider residence time distribution uh, effects, of course, because the continuous reactor will be not an ideal plug flow tubular reactor. It will have some big mixing properties. And the way how we deal with that is we uh, introduced the probabilistic uh, input. Namely, we considered a distributed uh, resonance time. For example, here the distribution function is given. And then we propagate this, so to say, through our reactor model or our fluid element model, if you want. And thereby we project it into the criterion space for here, example, if we take again the selectivity, then we can get now a Pareto set um, of uh, the mean selectivity, which you get here, and also of the variance of the selectivity of the meta elements moving through your reactor with a non-ideal residence time distribution. And then each point along this Pareto set, of course, uh, corresponds to one specific uh, design. The good point is that for this particular example, we found that we can really robustify the reactor design by the control actions such that the reactor is nearly insensitive to the residence time effects, which is a very interesting result here. Okay, let me come now finally to the plant level. On the plant level, we have now to consider also the separation part. So far, I only talked about a standalone reactor. What about the separation? We have recycles. We can consider first an ideal selective separation, which is able to isolate all compounds of the reaction system, that is the assumption, at very pure quality. And uh, then you can again play with the fluxes as a, uh, control variables with the external fluxes. And the only change now in our dynamic optimization problem is that we have you know, recycle constraints according to this mixing point here at the entrance point of the reactor. And the sur surprising thing is that um, the uh, selectivity diagram now shows much higher selectivity for the recycle system rather than for the standalone reactor. And now we get a curve which corresponds to what we see in many, uh, many textbooks, a decreasing selectivity with increasing conversion. Um, but again, we have a small local optimum at high conversion here. Here we see the control actions. Dosing of syngas and dosing and one alkene is now recommended by CONOPT, the uh, optimizer which we have used here for solving this dynamic optimization problem. And if we now look into the concentration profiles and the temperature and pressure profiles of the system, we see again that, uh, that here, obviously, the isomerization plays a very big role. Due to this recycling, now we can recycle back the isomers and can consider them as reactants, so to say, in a second pass through these reactors. And we level up, so to say, in this... Uh, uh, recycle system our isomers and thereby we can achieve 
much higher selectivity at the end of the day for the desired target product. And finally, we have uh, also tried to translate this into a real-world uh, process design, which is now this optimized reactor with not indicated here side dosing of alkene and uh, the um, um, thin gas compounds, followed by a flash and a decanter uh, unit, followed by a vacuum distillation for organic solvent uh, separation and for the separation of the N and iso aldehyde compounds for a given capacity and purity. And we have here then optimized the real production costs. We have taken cost models. We have modeled, by the way, these unit operations with standard uh, models, with uh, relatively simple models. Uh, nevertheless, we believe that this uh, yields uh, relatively good predictions regarding uh, the minimization of the production cost. I should also mention that we did a lot of efforts in order to describe the real-world multi-phase thermodynamics here in this decanter and flash system by using PC soft as our thermodynamic uh, model here. Okay, and the result is given here. We, what you see here is a cost difference um, with regard to the optimal point. The optimal point is our optimal reactor embedded into this recycle structure, which I've just showed to you. And we see again, which it is recommended to, to go for a very high conversion, much higher than a CSDR, so a tank reactor should be operated at. And you see that we can squeeze out, so to say, 2.8% uh, uh, savings compared to the CSDR solution related to the overall cost of the, of the total uh, flow scheme. But that might translate with a given capacity to some million US dollars per annum. And here again, we see that this uh, minimum of the cost was only achievable by a very sophisticated dosing of uh, the syngas compounds. And we were surprised to see that it, with uh, the uh, cost uh, function as objective function, the optimizer here decided not to go for alkene dosing, only to dose separately hydrogen and CO. The reason for that was that there was a penalty function uh, in terms of costs for dosing equipment, because for this dosing, of course, requires additional equipment that might lead to a higher investment cost of your reactor, and that is why the one alkene dosing was not actively used. Okay, I think uh, my time ha has run out. I shall stop here. I just uh, show you quickly, uh, if you give me uh, two minutes, yeah, uh, uh, thank you for that, <laughs> um, that we have also used the same philosophy, actually, the meta the, regarding the methods. There's nothing uh, really new. We have trans uh, uh, used that also successfully for a number of uh, energy um, processes, chemical energy conversion processes, and maybe I switch through uh, uh, the slides to this uh, final system. The operation of the fuel cell car is still a big vision in uh, the car uh, companies uh, because of the lit limited range of uh, battery cars and the much uh, better uh, range of uh, future fuel cell cars, but we, we know all that the problem is a hen and egg situation. Uh, we need hydrogen filling stations, but for hydrogen filling stations, we need a hydrogen distribution infrastructure and so forth. When it comes to the fuels, uh, which you might use to make hydrogen also on board of the car, and you find that uh, natural gas is a very attractive compromise, so to say, because we have in many countries, in particular also in Germany, we have a large infrastructure where to distribute our uh, natural gas. And uh, nowadays already we have, I think, a 5% car fleet or so in Germany, which is running on natural gas with internal combustion engines. And uh, that brings us back to the idea to do onboard reforming based on uh, natural gas directly on board of the car and to isolate then a pure hydrogen for operating the PEM fuel cells. Um, in that particular case, we were designing the reformer under um, using fluxes for water and oxygen. Oxygen is necessary to get rid of the byproduct carbon uh, monoxide. And we were also trying to figure out whether there's an 
extraction technology for to get very, very few hydrogen. Actually, there is one. Palladium membranes allow us to selectively extract at very high purity hydrogen from those mixtures. And we, uh, and this is, I think, an important uh, point here, a message. Uh, the kinetics uh, for designing this process were taken from uh, the group of Professor Maestri at Politecnico di Milano. He has, based on quantum mechanical calculations, he has de developed a um, microkinetic uh, network for methane reforming. And based on that and some reduction techniques, which I skip here, we were able to derive a reformer concept, which is an uh, autothermal microchannel methane reformer with more than 1,000 channels. 100 micrometer inner diameter each, equipped with palladium membrane and rhodium catalyst inside. And we have also embedded this into an overall process scheme, which we believe is an attractive option for future fuel cell cars. That brings me to really the final uh, slide of my talk. I hope I have shown to you an interesting multi-level approach to uh, uh, process uh, systems design. We call it EPF, Elementary Process Functions Methodology. The key element is the dynamic optimization of fluxes acting at matter elements and traveling through the process. That allows you to systematically compare different process intensification options. At the moment, we are also working on transferring these ideas and philosophies to particulate processes and bioprocesses. And finally, I would do, like to acknowledge DFG funding for our Inprom Research Center, uh, which is located in uh, Dortmund, Berlin, and Magdeburg, where many of the research is being done around this hydroformulation example. Also, the International Max Planck Research School, our graduate school, was supporting some of the PhD students working on these uh, topics. And I would like to thank many partners nationally and internationally. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking us through very comprehensive and holistic overview of uh, this new paradigm of process development, a very intensified talk. Um, I think we are running behind, but nevertheless, uh, we have to, we should take some questions. At the cost of your lunch time, of course. <clears throat> so, François Marshall from uh, EPFL in, in Lausanne. Uh, thank you for your talk and uh, really inspiring. Um, I, I'm not sure that I did understand what was the objective function that you are using in the in the uh, when you you define the trajectory. Yeah. You, the objective function. So, what what do you minimize? You you said it was a cost function. Uh, but, uh, we did it uh, uh, on the uh, phase level. We were only considering not costs, but technolo technological objective functions. In that case, the selectivity with regard to the desired target product, the aldehyde. But later on, when moving through the process unit and uh, so through the hierarchy towards the plant level, we moved over to a, a cost function. So finally, the whole process flow scheme with this sophisticated dosing